This is Coda Radio, Episode 7, for July 23rd, 2012. Hi everyone, you're listening to Coder Radio, Jupiter Broadcasting's weekly talk show taking a pragmatic look at the art and business of software development and related technologies. Joining us like every single week is our host, Michael Dominic. Hey there, Michael. Morning, Chris. How are you? Hey, good afternoon, Michael. I'm good, and uh, rumor has it you just got done pulling an all-nighter. Fresh off an all-nighter, Michael. Well, fresh might be an uh, <laughs> incorrect term, but yes. <laughs> so if I sound a little loopy... Not Let's just say this should be a really good show for um, corrections in the comments, I think. This <laughs> not is probably to get too fun. graphic, but yeah, fresh might be the uh, longest longest thing from it. Well, thanks for uh, thanks for coming. I know you're up against a big uh, project deadline. Maybe one of these days you'll share the story on uh, on that, because that's whenever you're pulling a 24-hour shift, that's there's got to be a good story. There is, but when the pain is not so near. <laughs> right. When there's been some time to actually maybe look back and smile on it. Yeah. Well, uh, I know we've got a lot to cover. Do you want to give uh, any kind of uh, highlights on anything particular standing out to you? Uh, in terms of well, we're feedback? Gonna talk, yeah, no, well, I know we have a lot of feedback today, but one of the things that I teased in my tweet before we went live, we do this show live on Mondays at 9 a.m. Pacific over at jblive.tv, was uh, kind of taking a look at... Um, the best use of developers' time and kind of getting, uh, you know, budgeting that time and and uh, those kinds of things too. So I know we've got some of that to cover. We've got some feedback in this episode. So it's a lot of ground. Should we get started? Let's just jump into it right. then. Let's do the feedback. What's our first one? Well, our friend Emmett from last week, um, if, if you didn't listen, Emmett is a IT sysadmin who needs to install a number of Windows desktops and his employer will not allow him to use disk images. Right. This was the no images guy. And we're like, oh boy, boy, this would be a lot easier if he could use images. Well, he thanked us for mentioning on the show, but wrote back with some more uh, details. Unfortunately, the details are rough. So apparently everybody's running different software oh, in his company. Yikes. So now no images kind of make sense, right? Because what's the point? Well, I mean, you can still do an OS with the patches. And right. I mean, does everybody need at least Office? You know, that kind of stuff. But yeah. I mean, he doesn't go into much detail. All he says is we're using, um, we have a base install, but 100% of laptops and everyone for each laptop has different software. So I'm assuming that there's actually no overlap. Mm, okay. Other than Windows. He says it's Windows 7. Okay. So I put this in the feedback because I don't know of a solution to this on Windows. Uh, Chris, I know you've administered Windows machines before. Who, me? Possibly. Possibly. Uh, to me, he's stuck. <laughs> if they all need different packages, he's, he's in trouble. Yeah, I mean for sure. Uh, it 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 really it really kind of comes down to so a lot of these software deployments uh, at the very bit minimum need at least some standard standardization. Like if it's uh, and and really I wouldn't downplay the uh, it, the productivity advantages to just having an image of Windows Seven fully patched because if you think about how long it takes to install Windows Seven on a machine, say forty five minutes plus yeah. you know another forty five minutes of patching and rebooting. Uh, you know, that's that's worth saving some time there if you multiply that across two, three hundred, four hundred, a thousand machines. Um, yeah, well, he, he says they have a base install. So okay. I'm assuming that's a base install image. Uh, his question, and that's the clarification, is more about those individual packages. Where he gets really where he gets really in a tough spot. <clears throat> and I'm just kind of making some assumptions is I would bet I would bet some of the software is old. Because if it's newer software, it might support that. Are you familiar with the MSI installer format that you can wrap yep. Windows packages up in, right? Right, right. Well, those MSI uh, those MSI packages can be deployed over the network via a mechanism called group policy in a Windows environment. And you can deploy different MSI packages to people depending on their group membership. So whatever groups they belong to, they will get different policies applied to them. So you could say, okay, these are our lab people, and this could be just three people. These are our, um, you know, finance department, and that's these twenty people. And uh, then they then they would just get those, and maybe you could just do base packages there. So everyone in the finance department gets Quicken, everyone in the lab department gets Excel, and uh, those deployments are then at least done that way. Um, that would that would be one way to leverage it. There's, you know, it's just the problem is is Windows <clears throat> sort of suffers a bit from its legacy support in this area because your hands are kind of tied on what you can do. 
Right. And, and honestly, I don't, you know, I don't work with Windows. First of all, I'm not an assistant admin at all. So Emmett, I'm sorry, I, I can't be more helpful here, but Chris, that, that tool you're talking about, is that that pa- policy management that's system? Part of, that, that's part of the Active Directory and Windows Network uh, infrastructure. But he would have to have a, then a full stack Windows implementation, right? So he'd have to have Windows on his... Uh, so he'd have to actually be running Active Directory everywhere. Yeah. He probably is. I mean, there's he not many. Is. Yeah, there's yeah. not many business cases where you have Windows and you're not running Active Directory, even if it's just a small handhold uh, handful. There are cross-platform tools that uh, give you more flexibility. Like, okay. uh, like uh, one of the ones that mentioned here in the chat room is uh, ZenWorks, and uh, also Microsoft has some has some tools, some uh, Microsoft Network Management tools. Uh, I again, I'm not really, I'm not really very enthusiastically recommending any of those things. Um, wait, wait, it Chris, sounds almost you're... impossible, but it really sounds like it's a, more of a corporate culture and policy thing. And I know that sounds like it's easy for Chris to say because he's just a guy on the Internet. Yeah. But I've seen hundreds of companies and the companies that uh, have lack standards and uh, the excuse that it's they need it for the job or it's this or that. That's all. If you look at it, it's usually all a little light because maybe another way to go would be something like virtualization, like thin app or some sort of that type of deployment, because then then you would deploy things as virtualized packages and yeah but it's just i think they i think they're looking at this from the wrong angle yeah i mean and and, you know i I think it's important to kind of sympathize with his position right he's not the ceo of this company oh yeah no that's that's a tough spot a lot of us get stuck in yeah his his bosses are telling him though everybody needs their own packages and i'm sure they're breathing down his neck about inefficiency and installing all of that so i mean yeah, you're in trouble. I mean, Windows really isn't very scriptable. Uh, so I, I guess, you know, immediately my thoughts come to uh, ThinApp. Um, he could also look at what VMware's solution is, and he could also look at terminal services for some circumstances, because then it would be... <clears throat> I guess, see, what I keep going to is if he could group people into categories, even if it's right. just a very narrow stack of applications. All of these people get Excel, they get Outlook, they get Firefox 13 with these four extensions installed, and they get their desktop set like this. And if everyone of, across this category is the same, then boom, I've just created a category, and I, I group them together, and I, I apply a uniform treatment to them. I don't know. Okay. Yeah, I'm just thinking. It, it, you know, it just seems like a, a very difficult situation no matter what, right? Because mm-hmm. even if... I mean, I guess you could improve efficiency. Like, let's say everybody needs Word. Fine, you make the image pre-installed with Word. But still, if one guy, if there's only one guy who needs Quicken and one guy who needs uh, PowerPoint, right, right, uh, and Light, or I forget what it's called. There's that. There's that. There's that tool. The link there that uh, they just put in the chat room that lets you customize yeah. a Windows install. But yeah, so there you go. Um, yeah. it's a tough, it's a tough spot. And maybe if people have any suggestions, they could uh, leave us a comment or uh, shoot in an email, and we could always follow up that way. Yeah, please do, because this is definitely a little out of my area, uh, particularly on Windows. And it's really, a, it's yeah, it's a hard spot. Um, yeah. You know. All right, well, that was a downer. <laughs> so let's go on to something positive. Okay. Someone named Louis, or possibly Louis, if he's from French Canada or French, yes, I said Canada, sent me an email written entirely in C++. So the first thing I did, <laughs> copy and pasted the contents of the email, ran it through a compiler at LLVM, if anybody cares, and it compiled and printed out a very nicely formatted message. Really? What did it do? <laughs> this is awesome. uh, the message was that he likes the show. He had a, a, a quick question. Um, well, actually, I could go into the message a little. Basically, he really likes C++, which should be fairly guessed, obvious. Yeah. No, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Hmm. <laughs> But he's being forced by his university to learn higher level languages. Uh Uh oh. Python in particular, I think. Oh Uh, no. And uh, and Java. Some or some it's either Python or Java or Python and Java. I think he has a choice though. And he really doesn't want to. And apparently, you know, his professors are telling him, You're not gonna get a job using C, which is not correct. Sounds crazy. Yeah, which which seems foolish. Because uh, I can tell you right now, there is a lot more supply of Java developers. Maybe, maybe, uh, maybe, he, maybe the professor means like nobody hires a C plus plus developer out of college. Real? I don't think so. Okay. I mean, I guess it's possible, but <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so are you telling me everybody who codes C plus plus has five plus years experience in in C plus plus in particular? That that how would they get the experience? Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 So what I told him is basically what uh, 
Icarus is saying in the chat, if you're if you're good and if you have samples you can show, you know, you're gonna find a job. Yeah. On the other hand, it's always good to learn new technology, so I wouldn't fight. You know, I, I actually recommended Python because you can write, you know, modules in C and C. Uh, so anyway, just for future reference, if you can send me an email that compiles, that's awesome. That's that's got to be one of the coolest feedbacks uh, we've ever gotten. I mean, on the network. I don't think we've ever gotten uh, an email in source code. Yeah, so my first reply to him, I actually wrote as a C++ program. <laughs> so I bust open Sublime Text and was just coded it out by yes, hand. Yes, yes. <laughs> you know, debugged it, made sure it compiled. Um, and then he finally replied. He said, I don't have time to write another I know, C++ right? That's what I was going to say. It's, it's like if people had to write emails like this, they would never get anything done. Yeah, but I tell you, you'll definitely get mentioned on the show if you write your if your email compiles. That's like, uh, yeah, some shows you definitely get on the show if you send in a voicemail. Like that's true for Unfilter. Uh, but for this show, <laughs> you write your email. It's always good. You're making it on. <laughs> that's a highlight right there. I like that. Mm, all right. Well, right and this you, actually, Lewis. this next one, Chris, goes into what we were talking about in the uh, show notes about the Project Sputnik. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, oh, yeah. Well, I should just say on the pre-show, sure. uh, we were chatting about uh, uh, Michael's uh, all-nighter, and we got on the topic of uh, your XPS 13, which I just talked about recently in uh, this week's Linux Action Show. Dell announced that they're going to make the XPS 13, their Ultra Book. They're going to make a Linux version of it available in the uh, in, in like autumn or something. I don't remember. They used some vague term, uh, but you already have an XPS 13, don't you? I do. I bought it a few weeks ago. Um, it came with Windows 7, and I just put the Sputnik ISO on it. Okay. Oh, huh. do you like it? I gotta say, I like it. I mean, there's a few little hiccups with, you know, sleep mode, mm. which apparently is a problem everywhere you go still. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's only happened one or twice. I really do like it. Uh, and and so the tie into the feedback here is Joel actually messaged me on GChat. Not sure how he accomplished that, but good work. <laughs> Thanks, Google. Uh, yeah, that, impressive. Uh, I think that's something to do with my Google Plus settings, but that's okay. So Joel was asking, you know, he's currently running, I believe, a Arch Linux desktop. Nice. And he's he's doing some development. And it sounds like he's starting out, but he's having some real trouble with apparently Arch installed some non, let's say, stable packages for him. Uh-oh. Like, like he's having everything's too bleeding edge. Oh, okay. Basically, what he was telling me, and he didn't go into too much detail. And I, he had heard that I, I have a Ubuntu dev machine, mm -hmm. so he was asking me how that was and how you might want to set up a Linux desktop. Okay. For development. Oh, okay. This is an interesting topic. Yeah. So it, it's just real quick, right? The nice thing about Linux is you have terminal. I basically live in terminal, mm -hmm. Sublime Text, and Vim on Linux. So your preferred Linux editor is Sublime Text, huh? Yeah, Sublime Text too, actually. It, well, you, the reason is that it's cross-platform. So I can have the same settings, the same button configurations on all my machines. You do that? Uh, do you like? Do you use Dropbox to do that, or do you just manually copy a config file on? The config files in Dropbox, and then I just copy it over. Nice. Okay. Yeah. And the same with my VimRC, actually. Because hmm. I, I, you know, I'm a little weird about that. Over the years, I've been tweaking my config config files. Uh, there was like my color schemes in particular. I get a little touchy about. It is nice to be able to have the same editor across platforms. I mean, I think a lot yep. of people who, when, when they hear, well, I'm a Linux, when, when you say, I, when I develop on Linux, I have the terminal, I mean, I think a lot of people go, oh, he's a VI guy or he's an Emacs guy. But then when you say Sublime Text, I mean, this is, you know, this is a very GUI editor. Well, the nice thing, it, it actually has tie-ins to command line tools. And for me, it has a tie-in to LLVM and GCC. Oh, that's very nice. So as I'm typing, just like a bigger, maybe heavier, nastier IDE, it can compile my code and tell me if it's, you know, horrible in some way it also has some uh, decent support not amazing support to read um like linux config files which is nice like if you open up your uh, apache con your httpd conf in here right and you say you have a monster file it seems to i don't know you could maybe speak to this a little better but i've loaded some pretty monster configs and scripts in, in sublime text and it never really seems to miss a beat or even when like searching through it or things like that yeah i've never seen a performance hiccup i mean it's definitely not you know the one editor to rule them all because that's clearly them. <laughs> right. Definitely not Emacs. Right. Well, I mean, the the number one the number one feature uh, Vim has going for it is that I can SSH into something, and it always it's always there. I love that right. feature. Yeah, 
it's nice and pre-installed. But anyway, back to Joel's point. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that most non-bleeding edge Linux distros will do a good job. Um, you know, I, my layout is it's an Ubuntu with a Sputnik image, which when I installed it didn't really have all the bells and whistles it's supposed to. So I ended up doing everything by hand. So installing packages with apt get, you know, just the normal stuff. He uh, he's probably I mean, Arch is a really great distro, especially yeah. I mean, there are some advantages to having some of the newer stuff. If you when you're working on something that might be a little bit down the road, things like that, it's nice to kind of see what's coming. Um, but Arch, you know, sometimes you just need to follow the forms and uh, check for the, the the repo notifications and things like that. Yeah, and I did mention that maybe there was a way he could change his settings, but it also seemed like he just wanted to get on something a little more um, slow than Arch, for lack of a better term. Well, uh, you know, definitely, you know, Ubuntu long-term support would be that. Ubuntu. I also know um, OpenSUSE is a popular choice. Mm -hmm. uh, Fedora is a little bleeding edge, but I actually used to use Fedora as my Linux dev, bo dev box. So, I mean, nothing's as bleeding edge as Arch. Okay, Slackware people, go ahead. Yeah. Although Slackware is stable. I, that's the problem. I've been in Ubuntu way too long. The other distros are foreign to me. Debian is also Debian testing. It's kind of a, it's not as cutting edge. As yeah. Uh, actually, you know what would be good, and yeah. I should be using I didn't think of it, Linux Mint Debian Edition, because it's a, it's a rolling release. Yeah, but I don't know if they're still working on it that much. Oh, is it dead? Well, not dead, but they haven't had an update for a very long time. I know it's rolling, uh, but like they haven't done oh, any like, major. Sh yeah, we'll see. That's, that's a shame. I really like that, too. We'll see. I play Mark Shuttleworth. <laughs> but yeah, because really, what do you need for a dev machine, right? You need your source control, so you need Git, Mercurial, S, you know, SVN, CVS, whatever. You need an IDE or an editor, and there's plenty of those on Linux. I mean, you're, you're not going to have a hard time finding an editor. Um, and you maybe need you know, a diff tool, which I'll mention in my tools section. Okay. Honestly, what else do you need? Dropbox, possibly? Stability. You know, you can... Yeah, you need stability. stability. You need performance. The, the only issue with, I would say, Ubuntu might be, you know, my last major time using Ubuntu was Ubuntu 9.10, and then I jumped right to 12.04. Oh, wow. It takes a lot of resources that it used to never take. Oh, yeah. Uh, and I kind of wish I could strip a lot of that back. Um, you know, you could probably just drop out of Unity. Yeah, that's, it'd probably just be dropped to XFCE. Man, I, see, this is sad. I'm sad to hear you going this way. Because, see, you were kind of my trend case that I was watching. And I thought, wow, you know, if Michael jumps on there and he likes Unity coming from, you know, the Windows and Mac desktops, maybe Unity is really a good direction. And then I was thinking, well, maybe I should just shut up and start using Unity more. And now that you're like, meh, think I'm going to drop it. <laughs> I'm like, what? You're well, right messing with my world now, man. Well, the, the, the whole idea of using a small laptop, you know, is that I don't want to have a lot of resources. I, I want to be low on battery consumption. Yeah. Yep. But I still want to be able to do my work with a number of windows open, including Chrome, and get reasonable compile times, reasonable speeds. You shouldn't see it impact your uh, you know, CPU compile times. That should all be GPU-based. It, it's more animation speed, like as I'm switching tabs and things like that. And oh, I only see okay. it every okay. once in a while. Okay. This is on the XPS? This is on the XPS, mm, but again, I, I, have, I have the lowest end XPS. It's that Intel video card. Yeah, that's what it is. I mm -hmm. think... There may I should look into alternative drivers is probably what the issue is. True. Uh, you could also try Unity 2D. They have a 2D mode where they don't turn on the comp okay. compositing effects. Yeah. And again, I'm abusive. I keep like 10 Chrome tabs open. One of them is always YouTube. So I'm kind of like a, a horrible case for this. Good man. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Like kill it, kill it. But there is something to be said for having a lighter weight dev environment, at least in my opinion. Oh, yeah. That's one of the things I was unhappy with, uh, actually, with the Mac switch to Lion. If you look at the RAM consumption between Snow Leopard and Lion, mm -hmm. damn. <laughs> like, it takes an extra half gig just about idle. So it, it's something to consider. Uh, Joel, again, we, we, when we did talk about this directly, it sounds like his main issue is stability. So, you know, Debian, Ubuntu, even Fedora, probably the way to go. <clears throat> Um. Yeah, I'll, I'll I'll save my comments for Fedora for the Linux Action Show. I don't want to upset too many people. Oh, I like to upset people. <laughs> well, honestly, uh, I I'm yeah. I mean, Fedora is probably fine for a uh, certain side of developers, especially developers targeting Linux. That uh, you know, I don't know. I don't. I don't. I'm trying to say something. He's nice. writing 
Python, um, I think it was in Django, but I'm not sure. So it's web server applications. Just not personally a big fan of Fedora these days. Okay, buddy. I know, I know, I know. Uh, Abe, is that our next email? Yeah, let's just move right along <laughs> from that, huh? <laughs> I don't want to be a I, negative guy. I've been negative enough. Yeah, let's not talk about the Nexus queue. Uh, so <laughs> Abe emailed me a little confused because I talk way too fast. So sorry about that. He is confused about what Clang compared to GCC and LLVM are. Uh, so first of all, LLVM and GCC are the same. They're alternatives to each other. GCC is the most common C compiler, I would say, in the world. It's called, you know, it's the GNU C compiler, GCC. Um, LLVM is also a C compiler. The difference is, from a very high level, this is simplified, you know, into like super simple concentrate here. LLVM is BSD licensed. GCC is GNU licensed. Uh, they do roughly the same thing. You know, honestly, my environment switched from GCC to LLVM on Mac, and I didn't even notice until like a week later. <laughs> it had zero effect on anything I did. Well, that's really good. Yeah, Clang had an effect, though. So now Clang is a front end for LLVM. Okay. Now Clang, the idea behind Clang is to give you better error reporting. <laughs> so instead of saying there's an error online, you know, 374, it's going to say, there's an error line 374, and we think you meant this. Oh, very nice. It's, you is know... Is it good? Is it accurate? It's very good in Objective-C. Okay, so it has its strengths and weaknesses, is what you're saying. Well, so that's the other thing. LLVM, there was actually an article, and I should have linked it, about the commits to the LLVM. It's a BSD open source project, but it's predominantly controlled by Apple engineers. Okay, okay. And people from the BSD camp. So... Well, you could say the same thing about CUPS and WebKit. Right, and you could say the same thing. GCC is very much on the other side, right? GCC is very much a, a Linux-style GNU project. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, exactly. So, and, and these are not the only two compilers in the world, as Disco, awesome name, by the way, is pointing out in the chat. Intel does have a C compiler that's probably faster. But, you know, 90% of the time, you're probably using GCC. Mm-hmm. And if you're not, you're probably using LLVM. And you're, if you're on a Mac, you're probably using LLVM. But, I mean, honestly, Abe, from a practical perspective, don't worry about it. Like, don't go on to the forums trying to figure out which compiler is better. Because, you know, it's it's just, this is not the level you want to be at. Just don't worry about it. That's the, yeah, it's a holy war for, you know, yeah. sometimes people get really focused on the tools. And honestly, a lot of the reason people are using LLVM and kind of the reason Apple adopted it is because it's not GNU licensed. Oh, really? You know, yeah. that's interesting. you're not the first person who I've heard say that. Um, and I so guess it, that makes sense for Apple. Well, it's a philosophical decision, right? Are you, you know, what is your definition of free? Do you sympathize more with the Apache BSD style? Or are you on, you know, or do you believe in the more RMS style free? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, and I'm not going to get into that because that's going to be... That's messy. a flame war. That's a flame yeah. war. Yeah. yeah. So my point, Abe, is... Clang is something you should look into. Clang is um, very helpful. Whether you, but don't worry about GCC or LLVM because honestly, if you're working for somebody, they're going to give you a loadout and it's going to have whatever compiler they're using. Yeah. And if you're on Windows, it's a different compiler most of the time anyway. So Microsoft has their own. You can install with GCC, but you probably aren't. Hmm. Hmm. I like Clang because it sounds like a Klingon. That's my contribution to that. Once again, you bring the level of the discussion up. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I, well, I just try to bring it back to relevant things that matter. Of, you know, real world the impact. Klingon. Yeah, the Federation War. I agree. <laughs> General <All right>. Klang. <laughs> so, Chris, I don't know if you noticed, but on Google+, Plus, there was some, shall we say, energetic discussion. Yeah. Yeah. About the definition of a low-level language. Now, this was interesting. Yeah, I did see some back and forth on this. I, I, uh, I wondered uh, if you'd bring this into the show. So what was your takeaway? So the people who disagree with me are 100% technically right. <laughs> oh, wow. Okay. Not what I expected you to say, but okay. <laughs> C and C++ are, by definition, high-level languages. Mm-hmm. That definition was made in the 80s, guys. <laughs> My argument is that from a purely practical perspective, and these numbers just came out, I think, by IEEE, 
most developers are working at the Java, C Sharp, Ruby, Python level. Mm. The so if you're considering C high, you know Java's the Pluto. Java's in the stratosphere somewhere. Right. I see. So what I'm saying is for the practical working definition of the discussion of what the what the what the what the market is doing right now of what I would say you know ninety percent of professional software developers are doing C is pretty low level, right? So yes, and the people who sent me the Wikipedia article that said C is a high level language, thank you. I'm aware of it, but it's not the point in a lot of ways, right? So there's also a difference between what's technically correct and what's practically true, or what's a more practical way to look at the problem. Because honestly, I would say most developers do not write in what, what under that definition would be a low-level language. And in fact, I think almost nobody. Exactly. So Icarus is saying in the chat, C can only be high-level if you compare it to assembly. I would even add binary to that list. It, you know, honestly, I felt like the C is high level argument was really pedantic. It was really, you know, we're going to show that we're super technical because, you know, we know assembly exists. Mm. I, th I think everybody <clears throat> who's a developer knows assembly exists. Right. But honestly, they shouldn't care. Right. Right. Or for their job, for their, you know, that 40 hours a week where they're coding, or let's be honest, 40 plus, it doesn't come into it, you know. They, they worry more about maybe the JVM. Hmm. Maybe. Hmm. Hmm. So, again, and this, you know, this leads to an interesting dis discussion of is there a difference between a computer science and a software developer? And I would say there absolutely is. That, and the type of people that were emailing me are more on the computer science side. Although, Chris, what's interesting is I had one um, older gentleman message me on Google Plus saying he had worked in assembly. Oh, yeah. And he now works in Python for a reason. <laughs> so, oh, really? He's like, well, I've learned my lesson. He's like, I would never go back to that, you know. Oh. And he and he even agreed that C is low. C is for today's standards a low level language. So, you know, remember, definitions can change, and just because Wikipedia, I would, in some cases, it's good to form your own opinion. And I'm totally, you know, if you disagree, that's fine. But just linking a Wikipedia article isn't a valid argument. And I don't know how Chris feels about that. Oh, I, I mean, I don't really have a dog in the fight, but uh, I mean, I see it's just two different angles at the approach. You're taking at it from a, what people are actually doing today in the marketplace and what's what what how that has sort of shifted yeah. the meaning of the word. And, and that happens all of the time is one generation interprets the meaning one way and the previous generation generally it still interprets it the way it was originally defined. Yeah, and they're both accurate. Really, they're both accurate, and there are people who are certainly still writing assembly. Like I'm not, gonna, I'm not saying they don't exist. Uh, I'm just saying they are such a small percentage of the overall development population. You know, even like Java, not Java. I'm sorry, even C plus plus is not a huge percentage, right? The big ones are Java and C sharp. So that's most people are at a super high level. Mm -hmm. Hmm. <laughs> I like Icarus in the chat again. Didn't your teachers ever tell you Wikipedia is not a valid source? <laughs> Fantastic. That's gold. Keep that up. Um, well, I have a an email here from uh, Nilsson, right? Is that his name? Nelson? Yes, Nelson. And, I, yeah. and uh, this, was, this was an interesting email because it's helped figuring out where to host his Python app. Do you want me to read this? Go, go ahead. All right. So he writes in and uh, he, he, by the way, you can email us coderradio at jupiterbroadcasting.com or you can use that contact form at the top of jupiterbroadcasting.com. And uh, he wrote, hi, I have a startup company that I need to run some Python applications uh, like web crawlers, for example, to insert data into a database so that mobile applications can get to it. Uh, what is the best low cost solution for hosting a Python application and a web page to show the same data? I'm inclined to use Amazon EC2. What are your thoughts? Thank you. This is interesting. So he just wants to do some basics, some basic spidering, store it in a database, right. and then a nice, easy front end to display it. Right. So in that case, I'm not sure that Amazon EC2 is a great solution. Um, I mean, I guess I'm uh, obligated to say scaleengine.com. You know, uh, it's, it's not a bad recommendation for it, especially if it is low budget and... Uh, 
uh, he doesn't uh, he doesn't need yeah. like um, the uh, the main thing I would say going with EC2 would be it's a very simple handoff to his client because he just gives the client the login to the Amazon account yeah. he gives them the credentials and says okay have a great time if it's something he he needs to maintain and run for his own sanity then he might want to look at something like Scale Engine you know I almost feel well Scale Engine I almost feel like there's not going to be a lot of traction on the servers he's writing which. I'm sorry if that comes off as mean, but it seems like it's going to have low usage from the way you've described it. Mm. You know, I'm almost, I almost feel like he could get away with something even more cheap. Actually, though, if your client's paying for it, go with EC2 because, you know, it's their cost. Yeah, and it's, um, it's easy. You know, it'll it's scale easy, up a little better. It's easy to scale and it's easy to hand off. Uh, also, things like the GoDaddy cloud services are, are really good like that. Um, That's what I was kind of <laughs> thinking, like a, a, maybe just a small GoDaddy hosted solution. Yeah, that, might be enough. Yeah, I think it would be. Um, it, it's just the uh, the uh, the main thing. It really is going to define what he what the base cost is. Is if he needs access to the whole underlying, you know, OS. If he needs a terminal and he needs all of that, those are just are sort of a certain price category to start out with. So they're a little more expensive. You know what I mean? Uh, yeah, than just like a really mention, cheap host. He didn't mention if he's using any kind of development framework. Um, if he was, then maybe a Heroku would be a good option, but it sounds like it's just a raw Python script. Yeah, yeah. So hmm. maybe yeah. just a cheap Linux instance, honestly, would do the job. Yeah, that might be uh, that might be a better way to go. Uh, the uh, the other the other thing you could always consider is like a um, like a server beach type system, and just do a small little Linux deployment there. They'll they'll flash like a Ubuntu or CentOS image on yeah. there. Um, but for cheap cheap i honestly i was just and i'm not we don't go to does not sponsor coda radio but i was playing around with their uh oh hang on they don't sponsor coda radio they don't no i know oh, i have some servers to turn off <laughs> they do support last and TechSnap. and on TechSnap, uh i was playing around with their cloud services and they are cheaper than amazon um and they are uh very easy to sort of just click 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 deploy click 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 deploy and nah, you know what get danica on the phone i don't care okay. i don't care how fast they are to deploy Speaking of uh, Danica, that actually uh, happens to. Uh, I don't. Is this me and Danica? Is this me on Danica's body? I've never seen anything like. I'm this. not sure. I got emailed to uh, to the to the shared email account, so I, I just had to forward it to you. This was very funny. So if you're watching the enhanced feed version, uh, there is a. You know, this has been going around lately. GoDaddy changed up the uh, the uh, the uh, person on the front page, and the internet has been has not been responding well to the change. And uh, I guess uh, I am the. Uh, Go daddy replacement girl. I can't I can't really argue. I do look great in that bathing suit. I, I think that looks I think that looks pretty great. <laughs> I'm gonna laugh when this video gets taken down from YouTube. <laughs> um, you know, uh speaking of uh supporting this show, uh, while GoDaddy doesn't sponsor uh this show, you do the audience, and I actually like that quite a bit. Um now one new thing we added to the website is an Amazon payments option because I know some people out there don't have love for PayPal. So now we have a $7 a month subscription option, which you can support uh, these shows by subscribing to that. We also have a $10 one on the donate page over at jupiterbroadcasting.com slash donate. And then that money funds all the shows that don't have an official sponsor. But we also have our affiliate links down here at the bottom. And guess what, Michael? Added a new one this weekend, Netflix US. Now I'm sure almost everybody has a Netflix account, but if you don't, Go ahead and go scroll all the way down to the bottom of Jupiter Broadcasting and click on that Netflix US link before you buy. Or copy that link and send it to somebody who's thinking about getting Netflix. And then we get a little bit of cash when you sign up. And I think you get like a free Netflix uh, 30-day trial. So that's not too shabby. So check that out. And also, I should recommend uh, Code School. That's our affiliate for Code School. You want to check them out. Anyways, oh, I don't have them up. I don't have them up. But Code School is, uh, is uh, a site that uh, will help you learn how to develop by doing, which I think is really awesome. So, anyways, Michael, that was uh, who the Michael. hell is James Hinchcliffe? James Hinchcliffe, James Hinchcliffe. That sounds. Oh yeah, that's the guy on the GoDaddy page. I know, right? <laughs> that's not, not Danica. Sponsoring, removing Danica, not sponsoring Coder Radio. Has there been like a change in leadership over well, there, or has the guy just gone mad? I, you know, uh, I think it's a new era of um, of equal opportunity for uh, GoDaddy babes on the front page. I mean, he, he does have a dashing facial hair configuration, but... That's true. That's true. And uh, he's kind of got a more modern version of my haircut, so I like that, too. Only it just looks a little messy. So, anyways, you can check out Code School if you want to learn how to develop by doing. Use our link at the bottom of the site. 
There you have it, Michael. Now, uh, I accidentally, when I was clicking around, I was looking for my Cold School link, and I accidentally launched Diablo 3. And it's like the universe was trying to talk to me. And so I have to refocus. We have to get back on track so I don't accidentally slip into Diablo 3. Should we talk about the power of the user experience? Yes. So experience, experience. <laughs> are you sure it's not Cthulhu talking to you? <laughs> uh, so I received my Nexus 7 tablet as you would have seen if I was on Google, you were on Google Plus following me. Again, I didn't sleep last night, so. Yeah. This thing's fantastic. Oh, really? I mean, you really like it? Not only do I like it, I haven't touched my iPad. Okay, so you had an iPad, and, and what is it about the Nexus 7 that's that's so great? Because I have, Honestly, uh, I don't, I have an iPad, and I've been thinking about it. I'm looking at Nexus 7 going, what? Here's what it is. I slide the screen, and it slides in almost real time. Well, but, but okay. But does Rather the iPad do that? The iPad does, but my ice cream sandwich phone doesn't. Ah, it's, so it's, it's the combination nice. of Android and high performance that's really got you. It's Android. It's the actual hardware design of the, I guess you call it the box. Have you tried yeah. popping the back off? No, I'm, I'm not. Did you, know I, it I just, did you know it just pops right open? No, I did not. I, exactly. And I think that's a testament to design, is the fact that it doesn't feel loose, it doesn't feel janky, but if you actually get your fingernails in the right spot, you can pop it right open. I, and I didn't know that, but I just watched somebody do it last night. Yeah, I mean, this, you know, I had to be honest, I had been backing away from developing from Android tablets. This tablet gives me a lot of hope. Really? Boy, Google nailed it, huh? I think they nailed it, and it's coming to stores, and... You know, this is kind of a, a PSA for anyone thinking about developing for Android. You know, forget the Kindle Fire. It's got a big market share, but it's a piece of junk. Ouch. It is. I'm sorry. You tap a button and nothing happens. Or it takes a second for it to actually respond. You know, the, yeah. Which will make your app look bad. Again, this is a issue for the developer, right? Mm -hmm. No one's going to say, oh, this Kindle Fire is a piece of junk. You know, Joe User is going to say, you know, Chris's great fart app is a piece of junk. The Nexus 7 will make you look good. This is interesting. So this was, they really needed a catalyst, didn't they? You know, they needed, honestly, it feels like Google hired some designers, which, you know, I know as developers, sometimes we really don't want to deal with them, but we kind of need them, especially if you're doing something consumer-facing. And there's the man from Google in a purple shirt talking. I know. There's, they got a lot of great shirts. Uh, they wait till half the video to actually start showing the device. It's a very Apple-like video. Um, what I find very interesting is, did you, I don't know if you saw the story since you've been so heads down, but Google actually suspended sales of the Nexus 7, Nexus 7 because they've, they've far beyond exceeded their capacity at this point. I heard they were sold out. I didn't know they actually stopped selling them. Yeah, wow. the headline I read this morning was 16 gig, and I, there's only the 16 gig version, right, has been uh, suspended, and that they'll be resuming sales, but they got to catch up. So as a developer, what does that tell you? This is a tablet that has market share. This has traction. Mm -hmm. This is awesome. I mean, so we have, a real, we have a real tablet battle now. It took three years, but we've got it. Hey, listen, slow and steady wins the race. Apparently. I mean, Windows was a piece of junk forever, and then ended up winning. Very true. Very true. Well, it's still kind of a piece of junk. But yeah, very true. Uh, um, and so just the, the relevance for devs here is twofold, right? A, for your, for your employer, your clients, Android tablets are now a serious platform to consider because you can use this as your main target. What B, I, okay. this is an example of why hiring a UX designer is actually worth the money. Uh, okay. Right? So this is, this is not about, you know, bits and bytes, processor power. I mean, those are... The quad core certainly helps, but this is about good design on the layout of, of Jelly Bean. You know, actually paying attention to how animations look, right. rather than just making it work. Right, right. Um, a project, project butter. Um, and uh, yes, and the, and and really, I wonder too if we're not seeing some of the fruits of bringing in a lot of the, uh, uh, Palm team. I believe it was that. Well, so a lot of people that worked on WebOS ended up ended up getting hired over at Google and you got to wonder if maybe some of the UI designers because the other the other comment I've heard a lot of people make is that uh, Jelly Bean does have some UI refinements over Ice Cream Sandwich as well nothing huge but there's there's some well, improvements again it's the little things that count a lot right so this is you know if anything this is a lesson learned even if you're not an Android developer 
the difference in a good UX and a bad UX can make or break your project. Now, if it's an internal-facing human resource management tool, maybe you don't care that much. But if you're actually releasing something publicly or commercially, you, you definitely want to take a look at UX. Because, I mean, look at the difference. People didn't buy Android tablets in great numbers. And now the Nexus 7 is sold out. Well, you know, I know from a user experience standpoint, uh, I remember when I got my first uh, Droid, I loved it. And I and I, just, right. I, just, I just I jumped full hog into Android. And then I got the Evo. And then I got the Nexus 7. And I was just really consumed by it. And then my wife got the iPhone 4. Right. And I played with it for the evening to set it up for. And I remember how when I went back to my Android, how let down I was and how how I felt the performance just like like on the iPhone like my immediate my immediate impression after not using it for so long was this thing almost has like a physical lock on my finger like it like my finger moves an inch and everything is exactly locked on whereas every now and then it's just or it didn't feel quite as precise on the Android device and it sounds like with Project Butter they fixed this even if even if my initial impression of it is a little hacky since they're kind of doing some predictive input guessing and then pre-ramping the cpu which sounds uh, honestly a little jank but i haven't heard any major complaints on battery life or anything like you that know, so yeah you know what i mean i i've had nothing but good experience to me that's it's awesome. not hacky I mean, that's awesome i mean that's awesome remember the general if you're developing for the general public they don't care about a lot of things that we might care about, right? Oh, yeah. They totally. may not mind the lack of an SD card, which I know a lot of people in the chat are complaining about. They might not mind the lack of 3G, though that's more debatable. Mm, yeah. They're certainly going to mind, you know, delays and button touches. They're going to mind janky scrolling. It, ma it matters more in a touch experience because you don't have any of the other kind of subtle feedback we have on a standard desktop. Like, you know, yeah. back in the day, you always had the hard drive accessing light. So you could look at that. And, oh, okay, well, my computer's not responding, but I can look at that and I know I'm getting immediate feedback. Or you could tell by based on performance in other applications because you had multiple windows open. But when it's a full screen touch interface, your only acknowledgement that something happened is the, is the device's immediate feedback. Exactly. And, and this is really a testament to, you know, I think Google's maturing as a product company. They've actually got designers who hopefully have some teeth on them now mm -hmm. and are saying... You know, just because it works doesn't mean it's good. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And honestly, and I, I think this is important to mention on this developer show because I, I do it myself. Sometimes you just want the designer to be quiet. Like, you know, I don't care about that drop shadow. <laughs> it, it's not worth my time. <laughs> right, like, just, right. just stop talking. You know, that's it. Okay. But the designer <laughs> knows what he's doing. If he, you know, it matters, especially for the general consumer. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. And I would think that this audience, and I, I hope you're having a bad reaction to this whole section, by the way, because that means that it's hitting home. So I hope you're annoyed. <laughs> because if you're annoyed, it means you need to reevaluate. And it's one thing to say, well, I'm writing an open source library and my audience is developers. That's fine. Yeah. But if you're, and this is one failing on the Nexus 7, I went to the Android market mm -hmm. with my nice $25 Google credit mm -hmm. ready to buy, buy, buy. Mm -hmm. The apps look like crap. This is this this is still uh, an area, and I'm going to take crap for this, but you know, you guys prove me effing wrong because I'm absolutely right. When Apple rolls out a new device like this, what's one of the things they waste the most time on during the keynote? They bring on dev after dev who's written this application in an unbelievable amount of time just for this device, and they tell you how incredibly great it was. And here's some premier apps you can go buy them right now, and you can play them on your new shiny tablet. And Google didn't really quite do that, though they did. They did introduce some content, some video content, so they got a lot of the ways there. But they didn't roll out any Cadillac apps to go with the new hardware. That would have been a real complete package, right? And 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 that's to me that's almost like you know that's marketing. That is not that's not really the point here. The point is, looking through the app store, there are very few iPhone apps that I've worked on, if any, that didn't have a professional designer on board. Mm, okay. There are a lot of Android apps where people don't do that. Oh, I see. You're saying like it's a lower bar in terms of app UI design. Right. And it, you've been getting away with it, and it's fine. And I've gotten away with it, too. But this tablet deserves a good design, and your users deserve a good design. Well, so Jelly bean and ice cream also. I mean, jelly bean and ice cream look a lot better. They look a lot better, but so the failing on that is that I see a lot of, you know, ice cream sandwich apps, they all look the same. Mm, mm -hmm. Note, if you notice on iOS, people aren't always using the same native translucent bars. People are doing their own skins. Yeah, yeah. 
it's just, you know, it's just food for thought. And I know this is probably upsetting to a lot of people in the audience. But if you think your project is good enough for general consumption, so for some kind of public marketplace, and it doesn't have to be mobile, it can be a Windows desktop app, it could be a Ubuntu app, you know, put aside a little bit of money and hire a local designer in your area. I mean, honestly, that's what I did with my project. I hired actually a designer in the Jupiter Broadcasting community. Very nice. Because, and his input, honestly, I think his input improved the app tenfold. That's Mr. Bacon. That's Mr. Bacon, yeah. the cheesiest of bacon. Yeah, exactly. Fact. He's uh, he's done a lot of good stuff. He he did the uh, design for uh, the Coda Radio uh, logo and the frame that the video uh, exactly. uses. Yeah. And I just want to respond to something in chat. Um, I said, I'm sorry if I'm saying that wrong. It says design feels like a waste of time. And if you're a developer, or I assume you are, so it should feel like a waste of time. And it is a waste of time to you, right? But it's not a waste of time to your user. Oh, yeah. And you, you're you developing not for yourself, you're developing for the user. Mm. Very good point. So, how do you justify the cost and the time? Okay, you justify the cost in lost sales from having a crappy looking app. Or a crappy looking... I mean, if you're designing an internal tool... You know, people are compelled to use it. That's fine. But if you don't have a captive audience, so if your app is just, you know, just another podcast reader, if you don't have a good design, people are going to go to, you know, Downcast or Instacast or Dogcatcher, you know, any of the thousands of podcasts app out there. And what I like is, Michael, you are practicing what you preach. You are working right now on a, an app for the Ubuntu desktop. And that's correct. You have literally spent a considerable amount of resources making sure that the design looks like it belongs in a Unity environment. That's right. And, you know, full disclosure, I hired Mr. Bacon. Um, he did some assets for the Mac app, and I'm going to be re-engaging him if he's available to modify it for the Ubuntu version. Because I'd like a, maybe a slightly different experience that's more... ubuntu -y. Yeah, Probably which is brown. more... <laughs> I was thinking neon purple. It seems like... I, I Back in the... Back in when I started, it was all brown, but I don't know what happened. Uh, I woke up and the world was purple. There are a lot, yeah, there's a lot more purple now, you're right. But again, this is not meant to be as aggressive as I know I'm coming off as. I'm just trying to make a point. I'm trying to make a point and I'm trying to say that I get it. And I do this, even sometimes I get frustrated with designers and I don't want to hear about it. Mm -hmm, like, mm -hmm. And one thing I'll say, when you're the one paying them, it, that happens a lot less. Because <laughs> you're paying them for all the time arguing with you. Yeah, yeah. So you could be in the driver's seat a bit more. Yeah, it's you know the designer is not usually if he's good or if she's good arbitrary. They're not, you know, they're not changing the font because they want to screw with you, like. <laughs> right. I would hope. Right. Right. It's then you just, got hired, then you hired the wrong. If you have if you, if it's if it's a confident a designer, I would think a designer developer relationship, especially if it's you hired the designer, should be very complimentary. Like you mentioned, where where Cheese Bacon said, uh, you know, this look might look a little better. Those kinds of things. It shouldn't be confrontational. Then you've hired the wrong person. Yeah, and honestly, you know, and you need one who's not just going to cow out to you. So we're using Cheese Bacon. I had a couple ideas, and he said, mm, well, you know, there you go. You have. To I know. I hate to, it when he does that. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah, you have to. You have to take his expertise. Yeah. Um, so, and especially if you're one of those who really wants, let's say Ubuntu, but I'm just picking an arbitrary Linux distro, so don't, you know, don't get in a rage here. If you want that to be a more popular consumer-facing desktop distribution and you're writing an app for it, well, it needs to look good, right? Honestly, people care about appearance mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in terms of apps. So we, we all get off that because I know I'm probably just upsetting people at this point. All right. Well, I, I think it's a good point to be made. Yeah. So speaking of upsetting people. Did I do something? Did I put my foot in my mouth? You and your, your Canadian friend. Oh, Alan? Yes. On TechSnap? So if anybody <laughs> listened to last week's TechSnap. <laughs> what did we do? <laughs> they had a very interesting take on the in-app purchase uh, scam. Uh, actually, now, I thought that was some of the best coverage I've heard in terms of like, I've heard a lot of people cover the story, and not very many news outlets have covered until recently the uh, the fact that there was a, a verification process that developers could do. I didn't hear anybody talk about that until like this last few days. Well, there's a reason for that, and and so I'm not con contradicting anything Alan said. He's absolutely correct that the verification process would have helped. Yeah. Um, I'm challenging the lazy aspect of it. <laughs> okay. Because I'm pretty sure he said 
they were lazy. Or maybe me. It might have been me. Uh, it, I think it was you, actually. I might have been trying to, to stir things up. Yeah. yeah. yeah you probably did it knowing I'd listen. Yeah. <laughs> I, I know how you are. Who, me? You, you want to liven up the show. <laughs> so, and Alan's correct. There was a verification process. There still is. If you did that, you were, you're in pretty good shape if you do it correctly. Okay. The problem is that you know, developers have a client or a boss like everybody else who's watching the money. Mm. That verification process requires a server and requires some kind of logic on that server. Mm. And it requires extra code on the client to interact with the server. Guess who's not willing to pay for that? Right, right. Mm. So it's less an issue of laziness and more an issue of, am I going to do this extra work for free? And as Chris can know from our days talking about a potential project that answer is no right it's it's yeah. a it's a very i guess you'd have to uh you have to be something that either a the company would want or b it would have to be pitched to them in the in, implement in the plan and i've had i've had this conversation so this is real world experience oh really okay interesting it, the pitch always goes like this hey there's this extra server component we need to do to verify the purchases okay is is that included in your quote no but we can add it on no, it's not worth it. So you really got to have it in there from the very beginning. And they always want to whittle down the quote. Right, right. So you could either do it for nothing, you know, just add it in. Well, and it seems like it. I could see like something becoming and let's like I, I could see like people like are looking at all the features and they're like, you know what? Let's do this one as an in-app. Like I could see like things changing as the project's in progress. And then it's like at that point, are we going to go add a server? No, no. We're just making this one little thing an in-app purchase. Well, yeah, I've even deal. had the extreme case where it wasn't even the cost of developing it. It was the cost of they didn't want to pay for the server. Huh. Yeah. So this is not, you know, it's not a terrible amount of work from the client side. And it's really not that hard. See, the hard part is I would say this should be a part that Apple should cover. But in order for it to be a really good validation process you kind of don't want apple being the one that's doing the verification but but let's play devil's advocate for the client because uh you know, slips in the chat is having a bit of an aneurysm <laughs> the clients are right in assuming that a very very small percentage of people are actually going to know how to do this yeah so the actual revenue loss might not make up for the you know i don't even know what a cheap server costs like 20 bucks a month yeah probably yeah all right so they're doing a cost benefit analysis and they're they're gambling you know that it's not worth it hmm. so you have to tell them if they refuse to host the server it's their fault you can't perpetually maintain a server for a client forever after a project unless they're paying for it it's just not possible now if you're like a marco armit and you have instapaper which already has an online service you would Dif different business model yeah He's you would just have it there probably and right. yeah yeah, it's not so big, but if you're just selling like little extra add-on features to an app and then you, you know, yeah, that's, that is a lot of overhead just to run a server just for yeah, the and, occasional validation. And, you know, Slips is right. I mean, if I didn't tell them, it would be my fault. The thing is, I tell them and they're like, yeah, but that's like 20 bucks a month. And, you know, the odds of people doing that are so low. And they're right. If the app purchases in 99 cents and they lose a total of $20 a year, it, it's a, it's a, you know, business decision. It's a mathematical thing. Now, if you're Rovio or EA Games and you're actually generating a lot of revenue, then yeah, you have to do it. Well, I should do some digging because I just read a headline saying they fixed this in iOS 6, which means they must have replumbed the way the process works a bit. So I'd have to, I'll have to dig around and see if I can find out what that is because I'm sure it's still under NDA. But um, that might be that might be telling. I, th I think Slips is dying. <laughs> Not sure what's happening to him, but if you if you're actually ill, that's a problem. <laughs> oh, slips. Uh, so uh, you know, I, you're right. It was if I did say lazy, um, that was probably my sysop bias coming through. Right, and and you know that's an interesting issue. We kind of talked about designers. I find that sysadmins always assume that everybody's willing to just spin up another server. Y yeah, because to us, it's yeah, you it's, know what. Yeah. yeah. And I it honestly, might. while you were talking, I was like, well, come on, they wouldn't have like a web server that could throw it on or something like that. But in reality, some people don't. And it is, you know, it, it adds this whole layer of complexity to what could otherwise be a fairly straightforward project. You make some code, you ship it to an app store, you're done. Especially if the in-app purchase is like upgrade to pro. To me, I guess I just look at it. My sysop in me says, well, that's the cost of doing business if you want to sell in-app purchases. Right, I agree. Like any app when I purchase, I have a server and I recommend it strongly and 
I would say almost all my clients that do have taken my recommendation. And honestly, the one in particular that didn't is out of business. So, I would, hey. I would, <laughs> I would <laughs> probably, I would probably be a business sort of. I would probably take a business approach and say, we offer, we can host this for you. And I would probably just on the back end do like a rev share deal with Alan and say, can you just throw all these on a bunch of scale engine virtual machines and then you know I'll just charge them ten dollars a month and you charge me five. <laughs> That's probably what I would do is I would offer it as a service as part of my development uh, package. Because I'm a server guy. That's what I do. I had a fantastic idea. Where's Alan again? <laughs> but uh, you're right. I, I, you, I thank you for calling me out. I shouldn't have said lazy. I should have said in well, some cases it's just, not practical. And I think it's good that you know this network has you know a very heavy sysadmin population. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Because there's, I think there's a lot of interaction. And I'll be honest, there's been times when I've been like, I want this guy, just let me hit the goddamn database and I'll be done. Right. Yeah. If I could just get in yeah. there for 15 minutes. Seconds. Yeah. Be done. yeah. <laughs> you know, and it, but it goes both ways. Sometimes, you know, eh, spin up another server. What the hell? Yeah. You know, that's, yeah. that's not palatable to a lot of people. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I wish it was, though, because it is the right way to do it. And, you know, slips in the chat is correct. And it's getting, you know, honestly, it's getting cheaper and cheaper. I mean, we just talked about it earlier with hosting that Python application. There are just a lot of really low cost ways to do it. I, th- I think that guy could get away with like 10 bucks a month. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Really. And then, of course, it depends on the volume that you're going to be getting. And then that's really what's going to drive your cost. Exactly. Yeah. Hmm. So uh, one thing that kind of crossed my mind, and I noted, I noted that you have it here as a, as a topic, is uh, from as somebody who just pulled a 24-hour shift you have in here working too hard, maybe you're doing it wrong. <laughs> it, it's called hypocrisy. It's, uh, <laughs> Kettle, I'd like to introduce you to pot. <laughs> yeah. So I'm trying something new. Um, I'm including an article I found on Hacker News. Oh, okay. Kind of tech snap, uh, tech snap style. Nice. That's really hard to say. Tech snap style. Yeah, boy, that is hard. <laughs> So basically, and you can read this article, this guy, go. he's a startup founder. You know, he's been a programmer for 20,000 years, he says. Um, wow. Now that's impressive. Ta- yeah. He talks about how the culture, particularly in startups, of working 10 hour plus days for very little money on the promise of, quote, equity and, you know, burning yourself out isn't necessarily a good approach. Right. If you're a programmer. So this is normally something I would have glossed over, but I've actually gotten a few email from, you know, particularly college-age developers who have been offered projects on equity. I have a pretty standard policy on equity. I say no. Really? Yeah, because my my philosophy has been if you can't pay my rate or you're unwilling to, let's say you're unwilling to gamble your savings on it, it means you're not willing to take the risk on your idea. Right. Interesting insight. Rather, so why should I take the risk? That's a very interesting insight. I'd say you're absolutely right. My experience is you're absolutely right. Yeah, because that filters out a large percentage of, quote, idea guys. And if you don't know what an idea guy is, you're, you're lucky. Meet, you're, you're very lucky. Yeah, you're lucky. Yeah, you, you should run. Don't walk. Idea run. guys are uh, so um, convincing and you, you, get, you, get, you get kind of swept away in their idea and their concept and wanting to work towards something that, you know, You'll you'll kill yourself for free. And uh, I have worked I have worked many many hours on the promise of big things, and uh, then sometimes it just never happens, and it's such a letdown. Yeah, I've done it, and when I was very green, I did it, and it was bad. And you know, Dursani in the chat asking, "What if you're green?" I would still say no. I mean, you could certainly work for a low rate, but get some kind of rate. Does this is this the uh, is this the article that where the guy goes on to say it might have been a different post, but it was along these same lines. It says a lot of experts agree. That some of the best software code that was ever written in history was written for the space shuttle, and the guys that wrote that did it at forty hours a week. Yeah, I think this is that article. Yeah, I mean that's that's a very powerful statement to make because there is there is an argument to be made that um, uh, you uh, at least me I work a lot better on on more rest, and I have this constant internal guilt about taking time off because. Well, I could be doing updates to the website because there's like all this stuff with the business like this that I have to always be doing. And so if I try to step away, it's like this constant internal struggle. But I know that that kind of recharge actually makes the other things I do better. You know, I have to say, since I went to a a more contractor lifestyle, I would say I can get more work done in less time by simply being very honest with my clients and telling them, you know, I'm basically a mercenary. Like it's it's kind of a mean thing to say, but you mm-hmm. know I don't want part of your company. 
I, I'm not part of your dream. I'm not part of your mission, but I will build you the best blah, blah, blah. That you I, could I get. don't have to believe in your vision in order to, to do well for what right. you need me to do. And I would, if I had an idea, I want people who don't believe in my idea because they can objectively tell me you're insane. You know, you can't do that. That's not realistic. You know, I think uh, that is such a valuable thing that a contractor can add as an ex- as an outside perspective is, um, you know, I'll, I'll come into shops and I'll go, I'll go over what they're doing and it'll, re- I'll come to a realization that, man, they're doing something wrong for a long time. And, and really, if they fixed a few of these things or, or before it got too bad, you know, they could be a lot better off. And if you get sort of indoctrinated, it's hard to see that, you know, the whole trees in the forest thing. It really is. I mean, and I've, you know, I've done the startup thing. I've been part of that. And this is a mistake I've made. Like, this is not theory. But if you can take a step back and look at things, you know, objectively, mm-hmm. and there's something called project smell. And it, I hear it a lot. <laughs> you can tell, or you should be able to tell as you do more projects, the difference between a project that's difficult, but potentially good and, you know, a death march. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. I've done death marches, <laughs> so, you know. It, I mean, every now and then, like you're in right now, you get stuck in a position where there's just a simple deadline that is just a hard fact. and So that's different than, yeah, so there is such a thing as overworking for a deadline, and that does happen. But It's different than overworking yourself for the vision. Right. If you think you're changing the world, you're probably wrong, or you've been had by an idea guy. Mm-hmm. I mean, and it's time to, yeah. Unfortunately, you know, it sounds so cold because like, you look at like you look at people like uh, Steve Jobs or Bill Gates, and uh, I mean they were obviously idea guys and also had a little bit of uh, wood behind that arrow. So there's not it's not all like a blanket like all idea guys are bad. Yeah, but, but you know what? Steve Jobs likes to play up as an idea guy. If you actually you know look into his past, read the biography, even when he was young, he was a shrewd businessman. Oh yeah, he did nothing for free. True. He. And he had he worked for Atari with no program experience, and he insisted on being paid mm-hmm. as much as their professional programmers. So this idea that because you're just out of school, you know you're somehow an amateur. Anyone who tells you that they're just that's just a negotiating tactic. Good point. That's it. Yeah. And you should treat it that way. You shouldn't get offended. You know, and it's very simple. Like, you know, personal experience. My rate's kind of middle of the road. There are people cheaper. There are people more expensive. Mm-hmm. You just, you don't let them say, oh, well, you're, you know, your first year out of school, let's say if you are, because I know we get these emails all the time. And this is actually, the person who emailed me was first year out of school and got one of these idea oh, okay. projects. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't mean you don't have bills to pay, right? And the way the software injury moves, five plus years experience in one technology, oh, yeah. it's kind of rare. And that's a sign of inertia. So if you've been doing Java EE for five years, I think you're probably an employee somewhere, and I think you've picked your line. Mm-hmm. If you're a contractor and independent, and you've been doing one tech for five years, you need to probably worry, right? Because you're then you're. We talked about this on the first episode. You're kind of a one-trick pony. Yeah. So let's say you've been doing only iOS for five years, and iOS dies tomorrow from a patent lawsuit. Yeah. Right. You're in big trouble. I, if there's any platform that's not a risk of that, I, I mean, it's, fair enough. We could probably use Android or you know, Android basically. <laughs> the uh, I mean, the one thing that platform has is billions of dollars. But Michael, I mean, what you, you make you make a really good point, and I think this also circles back to a point you made in one of our earlier episodes, where uh, open source can be a great way for people to sort of get their legs on on another track and kind of start to learn and gain experience without even having to be in a quote unquote work environment. That's exactly what you do. So like Dersana was saying, that you're young, you know, you're green, you have no experience, you want experience. You help out an open source project and you insist that you submit your patches via some kind of pull request that actually shows your name mm. rather than emailing patches to the maintainers. Mm. Because there's also a lot of, you know, open source is good, but there's a lot of opportunity for egos mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and for it to become a little clicky. Do you want your name on there? You want, honestly, you want like a GitHub style open source yeah. where you send a pull request and it either gets rejected or accepted. But then once it's accepted, the person accepting it has to show your, your credentials. Right. Sort of you, like- you, you never want to live for what you're building. You should always consider what you're building a product or a tool. Sort of like credits on a movie production or a, on, a, on exactly. a podcast or something. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, it, it's, I mean, I know it's harsh to say, but 
everything you build should be expendable to you. Hmm. I mean, I don't know, Chris, you may disagree because I'm a little bit of a inexpendable I, in the sense you should be able to just walk away from it. You should be able to get up and leave. Wow. Even if it's your own, especially if it's your own product, you should be ready to hit that kill button. I know you're absolutely right, but that is a really hard thing. Like I, so what I relate to is one of my shows, right? I mean, that right. seems really hard because that would be my product. And that seems really hard to like uh, say, well, yeah, I could just walk away from the Linux action show. I can walk away. I should be able to, but I, I mean, and you know, this is again, I don't necessarily practice what I preach, but I try. Right. So, uh, <clears throat> well, I give you pivoting on a being able to pivot on a dime is extremely important. I mean, it's it's important. Now, if you're an employee somewhere and you kind of want to go the corporate route to management, that's a little different. Yeah. You know, it's more important for you to become an expert in a certain area, become the architect, do that kind of thing. I think it's hard to be able to say you can abandon, you'd be willing to abandon something just because then also I wouldn't want my customer base or in this case, my audience to sort of become um, afraid that my next thing I might just walk away from. So it's an interesting problem, right? Is your audience your partner or your customer? If you can make them your partner and say, well, if you like this program, you have to listen to it, you know, and, and in a way that we can actually track or you, so we can have some metrics for advertisers mm -hmm. where you have to use the affiliate link when you're on Amazon. That's basically right. how we do it is. Yeah, we have, that is how you do it. You, you have to you donate make, and you have to use the yeah. affiliates because that's what keeps us going. Um, and if those drop off, see what's hard though, is it's hard to quantify which shows are causing the drop, although we have some basic metrics that we follow. So, so the Mambo King suggests that we treat the audience as our lover. <laughs> oh, I do, Mambo <laughs> King. Trust me. <laughs> um, all right. Well, very interesting insights, Michael. And I, I think you probably are right. Is I, and I think for, uh, for some in some cases, uh, maybe uh, people should be more willing to walk away from a very successful thing if there's greater success down the road. But yeah, it's I mean, a hard I, thing I to actually do in practice. Oh, it's cold-blooded, and I can't say that I've always done it. Uh, I can say that I have done it, but let's move on to something less depressing. All I right. Say. All right. What's our next topic? El pomodoro. Is, oh, I'm sorry. What is that? A is that a dish? Is that something? It, it actually means tomato. Oh, okay. It kind of sounds like a okay. So I pulled an all-nighter, which Chris keeps referring to every time I slip over a sentence or mispronounce something. <laughs> Pomodoro coding is a technique to manage your time in a way that you don't kill yourself. Oh, okay. And have like a, a nervous breakdown. The idea is, it's very simple. You have a 30-minute block. For 25 minutes, you code, you turn off. This is very important. You turn off Twitter, you turn off your email, you turn off your phone, you turn everything off. Okay. You have a five-minute, or and it can be five minutes plus break, where you respond to emails, get a glass of water, go to the bathroom, whatever. After that break, everything goes off. Another tw twenty-five minute block. And you don't find that like you get to the twenty-four minute mark and you're like, "Oh, I'm really at a good stretch. I got to keep going." So I do, and that's part of the problem, right? It's like any other system. You you have to uh, be disciplined. Okay. And I'm not saying this is the one true way. I'm just trying it now because, you know, if you've been coding for three hours straight, there's I find personally that I get a lot of fatigue. Mm -hmm. But if I take, if I get up, every hard on the body while, too. I, and I get a glass of water, I stretch. Mm -hmm. You know, actually, I've been setting up my workstation for a standing workstation, just for the simple purpose of back pain. Yeah, we're sitting like eight hours straight. I know what you mean. Yeah. I know, and I, I think this is something that a lot of people in the audience will sympathize with. Mm -hmm. But I, I've been thinking about, I, and it would be really hard, but I've been thinking about making one spot of my desk here. In in the in my home office studio, uh, a standing spot because if I'm I'm either sitting here recording right. or I'm sitting here researching or I'm sitting here editing and it's just it's too much. Well, I'm currently doing it with the Scrabble box to make my keyboard higher. So. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so uh, interesting enough, you know, I what I do is uh, I only allow myself to use email uh, three or four times a day, um, and that's hard because I do get a couple hundred emails a day. And so it means that I don't get to about 80% of them. But uh, the issue is, is every email I get, I generally, if I reply to it, then generates another email. So it's this, it's this, it's this epidemic by the end of the day if I'm, if I'm in there all day long. 
Um, and then the next day is twice as bad. So it's so that's what I found that certain I, I have identified certain tasks that take a lot of time, like Twitter and an email. And I just say, all right, those I can only do so many times a day. And I just and I, I've just made, I've come to that and I've made peace with that. And that's how I use those things. Yeah, I mean, I've actually mapped out how much time I spend using <laughs> email. It's frightening. <laughs> uh, so I'm trying now to email strategically when I know people are my clients are at lunch or or I won't be able to get into like a seven email volley back mm-hmm. and forth. Oh man, because, that's why the emails when you send clients and stuff or whoever it is yeah. and and their response back is call me. It's always like, no, you don't understand. I'm emailing you because I'm trying to avoid using the phone because if I get on the phone, I'll be on the phone all day. Yeah, because you know, email everybody's all business on the phone. Oh, how's your dog? Uh-huh. Like, what are you doing? Mm-hmm. You know, there's this conference. Do you want to go? Like, mm-hmm. Oh, I know it. I know it. So now the nice thing about Pomodoro in particular and the nice thing about the truck driving by <laughs> is that there's an actual, and this is on lots of platforms, actual timers, even for your phone, your desktop, mm. that will beep at you and ring at you and flash your screen when it's time to take a break. Little apps and stuff you can run on your machine. Yep. Hmm. I have one right in my taskbar up here. <laughs> so, and I have one for Ubuntu as well. It just complains at me until I take the break. So you're technically breaking it right now, though. You're well, doing this it. Isn't, okay. But this isn't coding. You're only right? doing it for coding. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I, I could simultaneously code, but that would be loud yeah 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 you'd have to get a silent keyboard well cool so uh, again that was called what uh pomodoro pomodoro and i will put yeah. a link to uh, more information about that in the uh, show notes for folks that uh they want to go check that out they have uh pomodoro as their as their yeah, website it, it's pretty interesting a lot of people do it with a task list and there's a lot of apps that also incorporate a task list which you know i'm a big fan of lists for productivity yeah mm-hmm. so you could do that and this is all relevant to development by the way yeah, because get more work done in less time. Be interesting Don't to see. A- maybe if you remember next week to do a follow up after doing this for a bit and see if you noticed an improvement. Because if you can come back to the show and say, "I actually saw an an improvement in the amount of code output I did after doing this thing where I took mandatory breaks," that actually would surprise me. So the problem is, I've been doing this for months, and what happens is I lack discipline. Oh, really? Yeah, I like force quit the app that. <laughs> You know, I, I just like, okay, task kill, done. No Here we way. Go. Oh, man. So oh, it I'm, hasn't been very successful. Well, it's a self-discipline problem. And that's, you know, the idea is that it's like dieting, right? You're not going to be perfect all the time, but hopefully you get better every day. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. It's it's a process. It's a, yeah. 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 Uh, it says, uh, Rika says, I'll vouch for it myself, though I've been using it for video editing, not coding. Interesting. Interesting. I, yeah, I guess it would apply to other areas. I Why couldn't not? do it for video editing. I, uh, I very, very much get into this flow zone when I'm editing and, right. uh, all all inter- all distractions and interruptions I find very frustrating to 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 really to, to, to the sure. detriment around people people around me and people who aren't in the zone don't really have sympathy for people who are in the zone. No, no. Well, one thing I would add about this technique is it forces you to break down your code and your tasks into small chunks. You end up writing more modular code if you're doing it right. Oh, interesting. So you instead of your goal being like I'm going to write this entire API layer. It would be I'm going to write the data model section, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. or this specific data model, and then you, it sort of forces you to just take it one piece at a time. It, it forces you to write modular code, so that way you can actually complete the task in the half hour, twenty five minutes. That's interesting, huh? That's very interesting. I'm just always going as fast as I possibly can, and the concept of anything slowing me down just seems crazy. But I, you know what? It's probably going to give me a heart attack in ten years. So well, you can't live forever, dude. Right. So. <laughs> Might as, well, might as well go out in a blaze of glory, huh? That's right. Go out at your desk in the middle of last, yelling about Fedora. Just draw up. Uh, yeah, no kidding, right? Uh, now, I know we've got uh, a tool of the week and a book of the week. Do we have a project update for the week? We do. So the project update is that I am a terrible slacker. I have been very busy and haven't actually been able to commit any code. Um that happens. So we have right. decided on some coding practices, though, and I think this is important enough to talk about. Okay, cool. We are using something called JS Lint to verify your JavaScript doesn't do anything funky. Okay. Funky things include, you know, not Im- improper quality statements, um, mm. not using semicolons where you have to. We've established the standard that if it's possible to use a semicolon, you must use it. Okay. Um, and this is all actually, if you go to GitHub, 
I believe this is in the wiki or in one of the issue documents. I don't remember where it was put. Um, Because myself and several members of the community have actually been editing these documents and really trying to nail down not only coding conventions. Yes, oh, and there's no eval. Yeah, this goes right. That's actually one of the first things in the document. There, there's no eval. Uh oh. So if you send a pull request with eval, I'm just going to ignore it. <laughs> uh, so sorry, but yeah, it, it's in the issues. Thank you, TechFix. Additionally, we are talking to a few of the designers in the community. Yes, they do exist. About what layout would be best, given that this is an HTML5 application, uh, and working within those constraints. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, Chris. If you're not familiar with PhoneGap, it actually sucks. Really? But you, you use it frequently, don't you? I use it when I have to. Only uh-huh. when it's appropriate. Okay. It's one of those love-hate relationships. Yeah. The problem is it's very limiting, particularly on Android in terms of performance on older phones. Oh, that's oh really? So we're, there's a pretty active and I would say passionate discussion about what the UX should be. Mm-hmm. Um, additionally, there is a lot of discussion about how we should stream video. And if there are any more adept, you know, I would say video format, video codec people in the audience, the issue we're trying to handle is that phone gap is terribly slow when it comes to video. Oh, really? Yeah. And, you know, my solution is, is not an acceptable solution for this product, for this pro- project, I should say, because I would do it natively. I would solve it with C. Mm. But... We need to know if there's a better way these videos can be formatted, or if there's anything any of the more the experts on video could do. Because right now we're, you know, the discussion has really focused on well, can we change the type of video we show based on the person's network, things like that. Which, oh, because the theory, theory being that the uh, the mobile right. version is maybe too high bit rate. You know, it's only 400 kilobits a second. It's pretty low bit rate. Well, the problem, <clears throat> right, so on iOS, this is going to be less of a problem because they all have pretty much the same hardware. The problem is on some older Android phones. They can't play those? It's, phone gap's going to be choppy. Oh. There's some overhead with phone gap. Right, and the problem is phone gaps doesn't really play nice with, with native modules. Gotcha. What's so, hmm, okay, it, that's an interesting challenge. To do something natively would require then to split the project into two separate apps, which... I still don't think makes sense for the process. Right, right. Uh, mainly because I don't think there's any other iOS developers in the audience. But if you are one, email me. <laughs> uh, and there's also a nice native Android app on the Android market already, and I wouldn't want to directly compete with that. Oh, true, true, yeah. yeah. So I don't think that's a nice thing to do. And also, you know, PhoneGap adds convenience, but it's also adding this challenge. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, yeah. there is... The one solution suggested would be audio only, but that's kind of a bad, you know, no one's really into that. Yeah. Yeah. And it's one of those things, too. I do wonder how many people actually watch video on their mobile device, but probably enough that they'd want it, you know? Probably enough that they'd complain. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Although that could be one. Maybe that'd be one way to know. Uh, All right, so I see here we have a tool of the week that might appease some people who've recently had their feelings hurt. Okay, this is not about appeasement. I just okay. want to start right there. Okay. KDE still sucks. Oh, oh, oh. KDIF, however, is pretty good. Oh, okay. You like KDIF, huh? Just not KDE it, itself. Yeah, I mean, you got to give it to them. They made a great diff tool. I mean, you can do this in Vim, so uh, you don't want to give them too much credit. Mm. But no, this is actually my diff tool of choice. Um, Chris has a nice video of it. It lays out the two files, and if maybe I should define what a diff tool is. So if you're not familiar, a diff tool will take two versions of a file. Let's say you're using Git. A perfect example, you're on an open source project, you're using Git. There is a um, conflict in, let's say, Chris's wonderful JavaScript beard.js. Mm. Your version's conflicted with the version on head. So you have to merge them. KDIF gives you a graphical representation of what the conflicts are. And you can easily either choose one version altogether or choose lines from a specific version. Very nice. Yeah. And there's other tools that do this. Mac has a built-in one. Um, you know, J-Edit. Tons- J-Edit, I'll do sometimes use J-Edit. There's a few in the, yeah, there's a bunch of different options. But yeah. uh, the one I like about this is you can actually get it for Windows and for Linux. So that's kind of nice to keep the same tool, you know. I like yeah, it. Yeah, it's, it's very it's very cross-platform, which is actually why I like it. Yeah, exactly. 
You can also just use diff in terminal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But shh, that's too hardcore. Well, maybe. So let's just talk about the KDE side of KDIF real fast. Okay. They should really just make tools. <sighs> Have you actually ran KDE for an extended period of time? I have actually. Yeah. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I think you're saying it, no, no, never gave it a shot. No, that would have been really funny. <laughs> no, I googled it, looked at some screenshots, and I just, <laughs> yeah, that was enough. That was really. That was all I have I passed to judgment. Say. Yeah, yeah. No, I have to say I haven't run KDE four or KDE five, whatever the most recent one is, uh, for any length of time. I okay. ran it for a few hours and got fed up. All right, you know, it's not bad now. It's not bad. It's so, gotten better. Just to be clear, I don't actually hate the people who make KDE. Right. Just I their just, work. Just their work. No, I think they should work on XFCE. Oh, man. Oh, man. You're just trying to get people to email you. Well, yeah, because it, it, it's, you know, if I get an email every 25 minutes, that's a perfect alarm for my Pomodoro coding. <laughs> that's true. Then if, even if you quit the app, it doesn't matter. You're still getting your notices. <laughs> just... <laughs> Exactly. All right. And well, this, this is not the same as you bashing Google. I want that to be perfectly clear because uh, I'm clearly right and you're clearly wrong. That's true. That's true. Thanks. That's true. That's true. Slips. Thank you. Uh, should we talk about your book pick of the week? The pro the pragmatic programmer sounds like a good fit for this show. Exactly. So this is an old, older. Well, not really that old, but it, this is a this is a staple, right? Every, I think everybody's seen this book, but if you haven't, you should definitely go read it. Mm. It doesn't focus on any one particular technology. It focuses on development as a whole. Okay. And it has, as the title might suggest, a big focus on being able to adapt quickly. Yeah. To, you know, let's say you're a Python guy, be able to adapt to like Ruby. Or you're a Java guy to C Sharp, things like that. Hmm. Um, it's kind of like last week's pick coder to developer and that it's not focused on, you know, a specific language or a specific stack. It's more focused on development as a whole. And I'll be 100% honest, I read this more than once a long time ago, the reason I picked it. It's because I didn't finish a book this week. <laughs> I like actually I like this I like this idea of the uh, you know it's not so much about the language it's about your pragmatic practices. Yeah. I like that. Yeah, because honestly, languages change, stacks change, and you know I have a feeling one day I'm going to send some patches to the KDE project. <laughs> that would be really that'd be really like as like that'd be actually really funny if you actually turn I, out to be like a frequent KDE contributor. You guys would never know either, because I don't think anybody from KDE, if they've ever listened to the show, they might. They listen to the Linux Action Show, so they might. They might. Make oh, but you know what? Here. That's not true, because I've gotten some feedback now. Yeah, we have, haven't we? <laughs> yeah. We've so maybe I should. Maybe I should just calm down a little. Um. So uh, now a reminder to folks: if you want to send us in a horror story, we'll read them here on the air. You yes. can email them to coderradio at jupiterbroadcasting.com. Maybe something has blown up on you. Uh, some something that just took the wrong direction, and you have a, a painful story you want to share. Send them in to us; we'd love to read them. And uh, of course, also your general questions and show feedback and all that kind of good stuff. The official way to get it on the show is Coder Radio at JupiterBroadcasting dot com or that contact form. Uh, I make a point to read the comments, but I read them more as like a, you know, it's not an official like those are going to make it back into the show kind of thing. So, yep. And so for um, interaction with me, Google Plus is the best place. YouTube is not. I do not read YouTube. No, no, no. no. Uh, so uh, yeah, search for uh, Michael Dominic. Yeah, what's your? What about your blog? They could check that out too, can't they? Oh, they could check out mdominic.com, or they could also find me on Twitter. But go with Google Plus. <laughs> and uh, you know, I'll, you can find if you want to do something on Twitter. Look up Chris Las. That's me. Or you can find me on Google Plus. Just search for Chris Fisher. All right, everyone. Well, thanks for tuning to this week's episode of Coda Radio. Join us live Mondays at 9 a.m. Pacific over at jblive.tv or download it on demand just a few hours after this episode's live every Monday morning or Monday afternoon at jupiterbroadcasting.com. All right, Michael. Well, thanks for the great show. And of course, thank you, everyone, for tuning to this week's episode. See you next week. All right. All right.